Um, hi, uh, my name is Donna Feminola. I work um, in the course reserves department at the library, um, and I'm just going to kind of go through the basics of course reserves and how to submit requests and kind of all of that. And please, please, please feel free to um, interrupt me and ask questions as I go along. So everything is um, in Blackboard in terms of submitting requests. Um, when you go to your Blackboard course page, which will go for Pyrotology, um, you should see the course reserves button somewhere here. Um, it's a default button. If for some reason you do not see it, you can definitely call us at the reserves desk and we can immediately add it. Um, so once you click on that course reserves button, it brings you into our system, um, which we call is ARIES. Um, and then this is kind of what you will see, and this is what your students will also see um, in terms of getting any of the requests, um, any PDFs or whatnot that you wanted us to post to Blackboard. Um, to add any reserve items, we click on this Add Reserve Items link. This will then bring you into um, different types of forms depending on the type of request that you want to submit. Um, article, you would just fill out this information um, from a citation, uh, and just all of the required fields. That's not how you spell article, but that's cool. Um, and then um, if you have pages, in the notes is where you can um, put, I guess, anything that you want to let us know about it. If for some reason you have a copy of it or um, you found it specifically in a website um, or through JSTOR or any kind of notes to let us know if there's something about this. Um, this tag one is for you. Um, since you, we don't have folders in our system, if you have a lot of readings, I can show you a course that has many readings and uses, um, utilizes this tag system. You can say these readings are for week one, week two, whatever it is. Um, when you do use the tag system, in order for all of the readings for that specific tag to go under that tag, it has to be spelled the exact same way. Um, so if you use week one for one of the tags, or um, you spell out one, it it will go in separate tags. Then you will kind of scroll down. Um, if you want us to locate it, we will go through our system to um, find it. If this is an electronic journal, or we will scan it from a journal type, um, from a co physical copy of the journal. If you have a copy of the material, um, you can select this. I will supply the material, and then you can either email it to us um, later on, or bring in a physical copy of it, or whatnot. Um, to kind of help us, because we're getting into the busy time for us, um, if this is kind of a, pri or a rush and it's a priority for the first month of the class, go ahead and select this, and then we know to prioritize all of those requests, and we'll go ahead and um, process those before we get to stuff that goes for the remaining part of the semester. And then you click on Submit Item, <coughs> and at the top, You'll see this isn't the best in terms of a confirmation, but you'll see this has been added to Aries. You scroll down, and there it is, and it's waiting. The status um, is awaiting supply by an instructor. Um, and then you kind of keep going through that. Um, you're able to select book chapter um, if you want us to scan anything <coughs> from any text. Um, just so you know, in terms of copyright, we're only able to do 10% of a book or one chapter, whichever is more. Um, but you go ahead and just fill out, again, just all of the required fields. Um, if you have a copy of that, a physical copy of the book, you can then, again, select this. I will supply the material. Um, if you do not, we will go ahead and pull from our stacks. Um, we will also get it from um, one of the consortium schools, um, or we, we have to go outside of that. Um, we'll get it through interlibrary loan, and then once it arrives, we will scan and post it to Blackboard. Um, what other forms do we have? Um, the book one is if you just want a physical copy of the book, you get to choose the loan period, and this is how long your students will um, have it out for. So we have a two-hour option or a one-day option. Most professors select the two-hour option, um, especially if this is a required text. Um, and uh, the students will have it, be able to check it out from our desk, which is located on the lower level of the library. Um, and they'll be able to check it out for the allotted loan period for two hours. 
and if they want they can renew it and stuff like that um, but yes you will go ahead and just fill that out again and we will pull our physical copy and put it on reserves if we don't own a copy of it we'll go ahead and purchase a copy and then once that arrives we'll add it to our collection and bring it downstairs to um, the reserves desk we're not able to um, put another library's book on reserve so again if we don't own it we'll just go ahead and purchase it um, let's see here. and then we have some of these other ones if you want to keep all of your like readings together um, and you have like the electronic version of it you can go ahead and fill this out and then when you hit submit it will ask you you can browse your computer and be able to upload the document right there and it'll go into the system for your students to just have access to and it's um, we will have to um, make it available um, there's also reserve items um, other forms we have. Um, the other sources we <laughs> use that for any kind of government documents that didn't have kind of a clear way of putting it in as a book chapter or an article or just um, just some websites that professors want to again include in their course readings um, so that's just another option um, if it is from a website you can click on this and then just put in the HTML um, the URL and stuff like that and it will go directly into that system media services um, which is also part of the library uses us and this is um, to put DVDs they also um, do clips from movies you can stream um, you can request that you do a screening so you can hold it for a particular time um, for your students to come view it um, so anything that has to do with videos essentially um, would use that um, media services form uh, and then audio we have we're still testing so that's not an option <laughs> Um, there's also if you have used our um, services in the past down here at the bottom you want to use the same readings that you used from a previous semester this will be a listing of all of the courses from previous semesters you would go ahead and click on the one that you want to pull materials from and then you can select deselect whatever you want um, any of the readings and it'll go ahead and be submitted so you can also roll over any reserve readings from a previous semester um, so that's essentially the ins and outs of submitting requests okay, yeah of course here. so um, let's say I want to um, I want to obtain a video of a new book that's available on YouTube and I don't necessarily need like the entire clip to the video I only need like one minute or Um, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure in terms of what media services their workflow in terms of if they would kind of contain a clip from YouTube. I know in YouTube you're able to start a clip at a specific time and then use that link. Um, I don't know if necessarily media services has the resources to, um, yeah, kind of reduce the clip. Um, the other, I guess, functions we'll go back into the courses um, you are able to see the status of any of your requests um, <coughs> from here so if there's something that isn't the only two things that kind of are available to your students or I guess two statuses that are only available to your students is item available on electronic reserves um, and then um, item available at the reserves desk. Um, so electronic reserves would be any of the articles or the book chapters, um, any of the streaming stuff that media services has done for you. Your students are only able to see the stuff that actually is available. You see all of your requests. So when you click on student mode, you're seeing what your students see. Um, and then again, they're only able to see the items that are actually available. So when they go to click on this, and view this item it'll pull up the um, reading from our electronic database and be able to read it or print it off um, for students for textbooks um, they're able to see the call number that's how we have everything organized and they're able to see the availability of the book so prior to coming to 
our desk, if it's checked out, um, they can tell if it's available or not, and then they can check it out or come in or put a hold on it and stuff like that. Yeah. So the Force Reserves Office puts a PDF on um, our Force Reserves. Is there already a citation on there provided by the Force Reserves Office, or do we need to provide that? That's the request. So that citation. Come up as exactly. Okay. So it's how you put it in. So for the articles, like the that journal title is going to be the first thing that the students see, and then the articles below it with that. Um, another option. Let me get back into instructor mode. Um, so here's those tags. Um, so anything. So any textbooks that you've um, denoted as a textbook, it'll just pull up those. Um, for week one, only those readings and stuff like that. So that's another way to kind of organize your um, readings. <laughs> I guess it can get, when you have a lot of readings, um, for example, this professor, this might take some time for it to load. Um, it's nice to use those tags because it could be an extremely long list of readings. Um, and I think the default, when you put it, submit it, it is alphabetical order by the title. Um, so again, the title is going to be the journal title or the book title. Um, so it's not the cleanest way to be able to search for readings. This professor has 300 items on reserve. So here are all the tags that that professor requested and it's going to be the readings and stuff like that. Um, yeah, of course. Um, so I've got you know, a lot of journal articles and, and PDF chapters you see this PDF. Am I missing out on anything by just uploading them all as files rather than going through the journal or, or submitting it as a chapter? Um, you are not. Um, in terms of copyright, though, how we um, interpret fair use is that if it's the first time that you're using those readings for that specific course, uh -huh. um, you are free to use it. Any subsequent semester, you're kind of violating um, copyright by not getting copyright permission. Okay. So um, you are more than welcome to get copyright on your own if you're using these readings, but the library goes through that system of getting copyright. I see. But there is no harm in terms of it. The first time you're reading it, you have all these journal, like for electronic journals that are available in our database, we never have to get copyright because that's part of our subscription. It's the book chapters that okay. comes into play. But one side, and if, if it's uploaded and I just roll over from previous class, then that's all covered. That's right. Yeah. Um, you are able to move any of these readings, if, it's, if you have a small list, you can move any of these readings around um, and then just click on save order. Um, so you do have the ability to kind of move your readings around um, to make it a little bit easier for your students. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I'm missing. And maybe it's really by um, they, the only way it's sorted by tags is this listing. Um, this list is going to just be all over the place. So it doesn't, like just by putting a tag, it doesn't automatically order it in those tag clumps. Again, it's going to be alphabetical order by the title of the reading, essentially. Um, you would have to manually do it, which is annoying. But I guess that's why the tags can come into play. Um, I think that's essentially everything that I had. Um, in terms of um, your TA, so if there's a, um, a TA that you have who's enrolled in your Blackboard course as a teaching assistant, they have the same abilities as you. So you can pass off <laughs> um, any of your requests to your TA and they'd be able to do the same stuff that you'd be able to do. Um, and uh, if there are any problems with any of these links, um, that your students are having problems accessing, or again, if they're like, I'm not seeing this reading, it might just be that it hasn't been submitted. We're still waiting to um, scan it. We're still waiting for a few things and stuff like that. So your students are more than welcome to call us and we can let them know the status of anything. Or you also can go onto your Blackboard course page and see the status as well and then kind of give us a nudge or something. Um, yeah, I think that's essentially all I have in terms of Hello everybody, I'm Stefan Kramer, I'm the research data librarian at American University Library and I'm here to talk to you about a resource that we are about to make available 
if you want to just try it out, we are already making it available for data visualization. <coughs> so if you have data that you collect in the course of your research that you want to publish, which you may want to do just because it's, it's the right thing to do, it's nice to do, it's good to do, or you are required to do that by a journal publisher or by a funding agency, we are deploying a platform to do just that. I'll show you what that looks like. Um, actually, before I do that, let me show you this model here. This is a model of the research data life cycle, if you will. So that begins here with the conceptualization of the study, where you think, well, I'm going to do this kind of project, I'm going to collect this kind of data, I'm going to look for funding from these and these agencies, then you go out and see what data already exists out there that I might use for my project, or is the data that I'm thinking of collecting already been collected, so I'm not going to do that again, I won't get funding for that. And if you then proceed, you go to the stage of designing um, the data collection instrument, whether you shoot a rocket into space or you create a questionnaire, or set up a lab and collect the data. Then you go to the stage of data analysis and processing. And then traditionally, at this point, the life cycle of the data kind of stopped there and the data usually got lost <coughs> and forgotten on the hard disk of the computer because what counts is the publication that comes out of it. And now, um, in the last couple of years, more and more journal publishers have required that the data behind the article be accessible somewhere so that somebody else can replicate the study. And funding agencies are increasingly requiring that too. NSF, NIH, National Endowment for Humanities, and others following suit. So the next two stages of this research data life cycle, that's where um, the library is now beginning to support that very heavily, if you will. Publication of data is the idea of short-term accessibility, pushing it out there, getting it available. <coughs> Long-term archiving is to make sure that this data remains available and usable for decades to centuries into the future, however long technology lasts. And then at the end, there's a bridge of metadata. I won't get into that today. That brings this data back into the loop for the search and discovery by the next researcher. So what I'm about to show you fits in this publication box of the data life cycle. And that is this platform. The two slide slideshow, that sh this shouldn't take too long, except I'll also try to demo something online. Um, and we're going to call this the Open Data Visualization Portal. And essentially, what we have here is the following idea. You can make data available just by sticking up on any web server and then letting somebody else download it. That, however, limits your target audience to those people who know what to do with your data once they download it. They have to know something about analysis. They have to know, they have to have certain types of software, perhaps SAS, SPSS, data, what have you. And they have to then know what to do with that data. So um, you could broaden your target audience, and there's a lot of discussion now on this campus about broadening research impact of faculty by making it online in an interactive manner. So it can be also used by the public or journalists or policy makers, people who are not familiar with statistical analysis or may want to explore your data initially, then see if it's interesting, and then download it for their own analysis. Um, that could also be, well, I'll talk about that later. So what we need, this is a pilot project right now. We're moving into deploying this within a few weeks as a soft beta release, if you will. Anybody finds this interesting, please get in touch with me. Um, we, we are looking for use cases of different kinds of data from faculty to try this out with. And I'll show you what we have already. Right now, the um, this, pro um, pro this platform is accessible at datapilot.american.edu, and it will also remain there, but the official website address is going to be opendata.american.edu. And we're right now transitioning from one to the other. So I will show you what this looks like. You'll see some error messages that are 
uh, function of us just migrating from one to the other domain. So what we have here is um, a platform based on one that is used by government agencies primarily for data publishing. It's called Socrata Open Data Portal. And right now we have divided this into three sections. There's nothing in here yet, so I won't show you what's not in here, but I'll tell you what could go in there. If you imagine that if you have a data set that you perhaps yourself have created, or you have a favorite public domain data set, and you would like students in a class to interact with that, to create visualizations from it, that could be potentially done with this platform. And the library is also hiring an instructional and designer who can help with that. So if this is of interest to you, let's talk about that possibility. I'll show you the two examples that we have now for research data and data about AU. Um, what we have here as a test is from the Cobot School of Business. Professor Frank Du Bois creates the Made in America Auto Index, which essentially measures, and this is the error that is to be expected right now as the new domain, which essentially measures how American-made specific, specific models of cars are. So it uses various indexes as where does the transmission come from, where is something assembled, where is it shipped, and so forth. And <coughs> I can measure the number one American-made car is the Ford F-Series pickup truck. And this is the raw data that you can see there. It came from a spreadsheet, and it still looks like a spreadsheet. <coughs> Here is then a bar chart, all generated online, of the same data set. Now I can see what's behind. You see the data set below in the bar chart above. And then within the same platform, I created a new <coughs> um, bar chart without doing any further data manipulation outside, which groups the vehicle models by manufacturer. And now Jeep shows up at the top, and GMC next, and Tesla next, and Ford, although they make the F-series pickup truck, is down here. And I think that's because they make a number of cars that are made in Korea, shipped over here, or the transmissions and the engines come from Mexico, or the body comes from Germany, and it's put together in Alabama. I don't know. So there's actually some rudimentary data analysis capability in here, if you will, although it's made for data publishing. <coughs> That's one, exa one example of what this platform can do. The other one is best seen in this section, which is data visualization as a map. So um, as a use case, I received a data set from our AU abroad program, which sends students from AU abroad to study. And I think we're one of the schools that does that the most, even on the shuttle buses. If you see that. <laughs> and so again, here's the raw data set looks like a spreadsheet, which it was. So that tells us here's the program. This is when it started. This is its last year. Might still be ongoing. <coughs> That's the country and the city where it's occurring in. That's how many students have been in that program so far. And then here's the link. And that would be one way of publishing da data. But again, here you can also make a chart out of that. And then that shows you for each of these programs, when you hover your mouse above that, how many students are there, what's the, uh, what's the country that they're in, when did this program start, finish, and then there's always a link to the program if it's still in effect. Um, and another data visualization of this same data set is a map. So in this case, <coughs> might not work. Let me try this. Yeah. Well, there's supposed to be dots coming up, but we have this migration of the platform. We sometimes have some issues. So if this worked as planned, it should in within two weeks or so, there's dots on this map representing each representing the program in question. And when you click on that dot, you see again the same information about the program that you could see in the bar chart and in the data set. So in this matter, if this um, is of interest, we can take any data from you and work with you to upload it into this platform and expose it to the world or use it in a class. Um, one nice thing about this is you can also take, let me go back to another one. You 
you can click on the embed button and then if you have a website any type of website where you can put in HTML code you can take this copy this out of here put it into that website and then this view of the data set will appear within that website and you can interact with the data in that website um, so that's essentially it. That's what we're trying out now as a pilot project, and it should be, as, as I said, fully functional at this address within a few weeks. So if this is of interest, please get in touch with me. Here's my email address, and I will also leave some business cards here. Any questions or comments about our data visualization platform? Okay, thanks for your attention. And over to Janice. <laughs> so, hello, I'm Janice. I'm reference and instruction at the library. Are any of you college writing instructors? No? Okay. I work mostly with them. So, I am going to talk about everything else <laughs> that the library has. And I will try to make it as broad and unboring as possible. Obviously, if you have questions, stop me. Um, we're basically just going to look at the website and parse it out from there. So how many of you have used your library account already or gone to the building? Yay, okay, a few people. You were there earlier, you were there earlier. So that's the first step. Um, if you forget everything I say today or if you just want to walk out after I say this, Basically, everything I'm going to tell you can be found here. More eloquently stated than I will say it. Okay, so first I want to talk about finding things. So we use a library search engine. So we still have the catalog, yes, but this is this is rolled out fairly recently so um, it's improved each year and I think it's really good now I use it primarily um, so it it aspires to be like Google it is not there yet but you can access most of our collection through it so it indexes I think 90% of our database contact content all of our media all of our books etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's a big tool um, so let's just do a demo search to get started. So search box is what it's called. It lives here under all these tabs. Um, as you may have guessed, look, there's a reserves tab. <laughs> um, these are pre-set to only search this type of content. I'm going to start with the everything tab because why not? Um, Something to be aware of. It's always going to pop up a new tab for you with your search results. So people get confused about that all the time. They don't know where their search results are. Um, so advanced search is here. It's kind of hidden. If you are looking for something specific, you don't want to mess around with the 600,000 results. Um, search by author, search by title, search by ISBN if you really want to get fancy. Um, it's all there. Back to basic. So we are getting a lot of results. Um, you can use all these refining boxes on your left to make that number smaller. So let's say I just want items with full text online and scholarly, peer reviewed, etc., etc. I just want journal articles, and I just want them to be published in the last five years. So, we took out about 800,000 results. We still got a lot, but it's a little more manageable now. Um, notice that the new exclude newspaper articles is always checked. It's built, we've programmed it that way because we have so many newspaper databases that if we left it otherwise, you would just constantly be wading through thousands and thousands of newspaper results. So that is search box. Um, 
Do we have any questions so far? Good? Okay. So I told you the catalog still exists. If you would rather search that way, it is here under search the catalog. Ta-da! Okay, so let's talk about specific journals and databases. We have a ton. Um, if you are looking for, I don't know, a science journal, they're all listed A to Z here. You can search it. And it will give you all the science journals. You can browse by category. Blah, blah, blah. There we go. Same thing, more or less, with the databases. So, like I said, we have over 400. You can search for something that you know and love, like Academic Search Premier, through the A to Z list. You can look at them by subject. Um, you can also access them through the subject guides. So, the subject guides are basically very um, simple websites that are made by our subject librarians and they're aggregations of all of the databases that are relevant for the particular discipline. So we've kind of grouped them out for you. Um, I There are also many general subject guides. So let me go back. For example, we have, I taught the citation software course earlier, we have all of our citation guides here. So it's the name's a little misleading. Um, we have aggregations of encyclopedias. We also have a faculty research um, guide that's pretty robust, and we are currently revamping that, so we'll be done in about a week. So for those of you that will be or are currently working on tenure files, um, there are lots of tools for you here. Okay. So I would um, advise you to just browse these. They're great tools for you and for your students. Um, we have, as you can see, like the business school has a lot of guides. If you want something specific for one of your classes, um, we are happy to do that. Just contact your subject librarian and we can make a guide for your class. Um, the guides when are also searchable, so if you're just not seeing something, it's there. All right, questions about subject guides? Yes. So the information you're showing us now, mm -hmm. when do students, specifically freshman students, get to use the Off the bat. So that's a great question for me because I work with the college writing classes. So college writing is the basic undergraduate introduction to research. Um, every student is required to take it. It's a 100 class and a 101. So ideally, I get FaceTime with them twice a semester. Um, early just to get them acquainted with what's at the library and then later when they're actually involved in a project and then we get them again in the spring. So the other thing which I will talk about in a second is we have a pretty robust in library instruction program here. So you are encouraged um, to contact your subject librarian and they can give you discipline specific instruction for your classes um, as much or as little as you want. That's up to you and I will talk about that in a second. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, so we know how to find things. Let's talk about borrowing things. Um, have any of you ever dealt with a consortium library before? Yes? Okay, do you know? We are one, so that's good. So we, since you're all part of the AU community, you also have access to Catholics Collection, Gallaudet, George Mason, George Washington, Georgetown, Howard, Marymount, Trinity, and UDC. 
So um, you are often going to hear people talking about the Washington Research Library Consortium or the WRLC, and that's what it is. So you may see things in the catalog that are not actually physically present on the campus. Um, so you may request something. It, we can, it's very quick. We have couriers every day. Um, we'll get it to you um, in a matter of usually days. So um, a big caveat, we don't share ebooks. So that is, it's a hot topic, it's a hot issue, and it's really bound up in the publishing rules, and there's not a whole lot of wiggle room on our side. So it's very unfortunate because the students love it. Um, but so I wanted to point out, let's see, a lot of these are ebooks. Did I say this? No. Okay. I just want to give you, okay, so you're going to see a lot of acronyms in the catalog. CU is Catholic University, so that one's at Catholic. It's sometimes it takes a little digging to find out where the book actually is, but you can find out if you really want to. Um, as you can see, if we've got multiple copies, you can see you'll see all of the copies in the consortium. George Mason, this is Georgetown. Um, we've got eBooks. We've got Marymount. Blah blah blah. Um, you can also you can search. So obviously, you might be in a rush. You want to limit stuff to actually things that are just here on campus, that is an option right here at, or no, that's the wrong one, items at my institution. If you live close to Georgetown and you wanted to go over there and, and take things out, which you can do, um, you could limit it here to Georgetown. Yeah? Oh, there it is. Oh, we'll get to that. Yes. So that is my next page. Um, so you see, you use interlibrary loan. What is interlibrary loan? Oh, Tell me all about it. So, yep, we essentially have two kinds of interlibrary loan. We have the consortium loans that are they typically get here a little faster because they're here in the in the city, and then we have the traditional. ILL, which is, you know, we could be getting books from the UC system or somewhere, anywhere, you know, in, that we have borrowing privileges. So all you really need to know is that some books will be here really fast and some books will take longer. Um, you can pick them all up at the borrowing desk in the library. Yes, 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 yes. Um, Articles, so you can request any any type of media through consortium loans and through ILL. Articles are typically scanned and emailed, so they, those can be as fast as a couple of hours. Um, those, you know, you'll just get in your inbox. Everything else you physically will have to pick up. Um, so, bottom line, if we don't have something and you can't wait for the purchasing to go through, you can look interlibrary loan it in the meantime, and we'll get it for you. Um, so loan length, faculty get from six weeks to four months. So we have three big dates every year um, that you don't need to know what they are right now. Um, unless someone recalls a book from you, then you're going to get an email saying that your loan period is shortened. Please bring it back. Um, proxy borrowing. Has anyone ever had a proxy, like one of your grad students or whatever? So it's you want to, you can give your TA faculty proxy borrowing privileges. So essentially, they can come th come and check these out on your behalf. So if you're too busy to get to the library, you can send them over. It's a simple form. Um, you do actually have to physically print it out and sign it, and then you can send it with them. So if you don't want to, you can never. <laughs> we would love to see you, but you know we understand people lead busy lives. Um, fines do happen sometimes. Anything that is checked out by the proxy on your account 
goes to you, so fine, just go to you, even if they lose the book. Um, but we will, we're fair people to work with you. Um, any questions about proxies? Books on demand. So, say you find this wonderful book in our catalog. And you want to have, you're like, oh, someone else is going to be getting that before I can get to the library. You can request it. This one is a bad example because it's actually off-site in storage. But you can request things that are here physically on campus. We can pull them for you and hold them down at the borrowing desk. It is still first come, first serve. If someone runs up there two seconds after you put your request in and gets it and brings it down, it'll be there. Um, it's a nice service, especially if you know you need like five or six books at the same time so you can pull them they'll be waiting for you for seven or ten days yeah. yep um technology borrowing is another exciting thing so we have lots of things um laptops of many makes apple and pc uh ipads those tiny laptops, headsets with microphones, mobile projectors, blah, blah, blah. We have six Google Plus that are reserved only for faculty. So this, that list I gave you is just faculty loans. We have a ton of stuff, you know, calculators and the like for students as well. Um, so those all can be checked out downstairs at the reserves and technology desk. Um, we have tons of things. And tell your students if they have any. Um, it's probably there. So the last thing I want to tell you about borrowing things is if you need to renew or you want to see what you have checked out, um, it's here under the My Account tab. If you ever have problems with your account, you can call the borrowing desk or email them, and they will figure it out for you. Um, that's that. It's pretty straightforward. Make sure you select American. You can forget to do that. Okay, so instructional support. Once again, this is all more or less here in different words. So we already talked about reserves. Um, does anyone know anything about information literacy? Ideas about what it is? No? Okay. Good. It's my job. Um, so we, information literacy is all about locating, evaluating, citing, and effectively using information. So AU, I think two years ago, made it an official learning outcome for all gen ed classes. So we actually have a formal plan, it's built in, we have a rubric that um, is available for all faculty, um, and then we are here to back you up if you need assistance doing that. So you can request a session through the website. It is a very simple form. You can select a location. We can come to you. You can come to us. Um, all, all the different things. You can request it. It can be from a general reference librarian, or you can use the subject specialist. Um, it's up to you. So, all right, you may be wondering, who is my subject specialist? We have a list of them. They're all mm -hmm. here. And email, you'll, I assume, be getting emails from all of them soon. And I'm assuming you're getting emails from everyone on campus right now, so it may have gotten lost. So this handy list is here should you need it. Okay, so... Do you have any questions about requesting instruction, what it might entail, do you have to do it? <laughs> okay, um, media. So we talked about media, but you can also schedule media here. If you need something purchased, if you need to get like some sort of streaming, 
they do they'll burn you a DVD of like a compilation. They they have a pretty they're pretty accommodating. <coughs> um, it's all available here. Um, if you have in depth media questions, we have a media librarian that is very fabulous. His name is Chris Lewis. He lives downstairs in the library. Um, we have huge streaming video collections too for your own personal pleasure. I use them at home all the time. Um, so, let's see. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about is stuff that you may um, want to know for the sake of your students. We have in the last year co-located a bunch of the campus services in the library. For example, the Writing Center is now there. We have a STAT Support Center. Um, the IT, the Office of Information Technology, has a, their um, support center is actually in the library on the first, the walk-in floor. Now, of course, we have the reference desk. Um, you can send them for consultations with us. We can schedule it. Um, we have a ton of video tutorials if you know somebody's really struggling with using any sort of library resources. Um, we have, if they, if you have specific technology specifications for your students, the New Media Center does one-on-one -on -one consultations with tons of media production software and hardware, so um, lots of ways for us to help. Did you? Oh, okay, so the last thing I wanted to show you is the Ask the Librarian button. We have, so you can, we're there most of the time, and in starting in the fall, we have extended chat hours, like until 2 a.m., so if you forgot something I said today, which I expect that you will, um, come here and you can get us on chat, you can email us, you can email the subject specialists directly, there's a big list again. Um, same for the students, you know, anytime we're here. Um, this is not current, we'll be updating the hours soon, but this is always the go-to. You, you can get it from your house, you can get it from your mobile, call us, text us, whatever. Um, we're happy to answer your questions. There's no question too small. If you're having trouble getting into the databases at home, you know it happens, like your proxy gets messed up sometimes, or in your office, I don't know, um, we can fix it. Also, OIT, who is kind of like the, the Office of Information Technology, has a chat, and so if your computer is just crashing, <laughs> and you can like chat them on your mobile, um, they can be lifesavers. So, that is a quick and dirty intro to the library. Does anyone have any questions? Well, that was a lot, it's a lot during the semester. During the semester, semester yes. Right. Oh, how old? Um, mm -hmm. The desk, it, it really varies, and let me just show you, rather than tell you, we, about under this, about the library tab, our hours change, like right now it's intercession, so it's annoying, we have shorter hours. You can always find them here by the day. Um, so at some point in the semester, we go to 24 hours. The desks are not staffed. You'll need people will need to swipe in with their cards, but the building is open for studying and whatnot. Um, and obviously, they have access to the books and computers and everything. Um, if you are really dedicated to the library, you can subscribe to our calendar, so you'll always know when we're open. Any other questions? Tours. Yes, we have several tours um, starting at the end of this week and then they run for a couple weeks in the semester. We also have, um, we used to do a lot more work at walk in workshops and we've kind of done away with those because it, they're just, it's so hit or miss with attendance. But um, we do have intro to the library walk in workshops really regularly at the beginning of the semester and we are happy to schedule, you know, if you have specific questions about a specific resource for your own reasons or for your whole class, like, we can, we'll make a workshop. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Can I send them out? Um, there should be. I unfortunately am not the person that would know that. <laughs> um, it'll be posted in the, have you been getting the Today at AU emails? It should be there. Um, it's also us on our Facebook page. <laughs> yes, social media. The library of social media. In fact, maybe we should just look at that now and see where it is. There's our new exhibit, student activism. Um, it'll be there. It doesn't, I don't see it yet, but. Any other questions before we get out early? So, so if we want to schedule a um, specific session for like something that is a person on mm -hmm. So I would go to the person that handles my area. Sure, yeah. So, um, if for some reason you don't end up meeting them, if you go to the services for faculty, we've got that whole, the list of subject specialists. Find your, your subject specialist and then web forms. Library instruction right here. And then we have, there's a drop down that lists all the names. And this, this will just be emailed directly to them um, and they'll get back to you. And we're very accommodating. It can be evening, you know, anything else? Okay. Um, thanks for coming.